Well, good morning, everyone. It is, in fact, Holy Thursday. Great to be uh, joining you here today via Sean the Baptist Live. This is, uh, I suppose it's, uh, well, it's as much as the uh, the liturgy of the church is traditional, uh, it is uh, somewhat traditional, I suppose, for me to join you on, on Holy Thursday morning and really all the mornings of the, the Sacred Triduum to talk a little bit about uh, these these liturgies. Um, I'll didn't get a, a chance to, to post this really much ahead of time, so I'll, I'll give people um, a chance to kind of get uh, signed in here uh, a little bit as we get we get started. Um, so uh, today, Holy Thursday, is a uh, day on which we, of course, begin uh, something that is known as so big as it uh, is simply known as the Great Three Days. So in, in Latin, the, the word for this is triduum, triduum. That's three days. Uh, and they're they're so holy that when the church was trying to figure out, well, what do we call the, the three holiest days of the whole year? We, uh, well, we thought we'd just call the three days, triduum. So that's what uh, we begin, actually, th th this evening. So uh, people ask, like, well, when does Lent end? And, and when when does Easter begin? So to, to give you the, the official answer to that question right now, Lent officially ends this evening or late this afternoon, we could say, uh, because Easter actually begins Holy Saturday night. And so the, the three days, the Triduum, are actually a, a season of their own that, that go in between, uh, as it were, these seasons of Lent and Easter, they are three days that are all their own. So if you see liturgical calendars, sometimes you'll just see that, well, these are uh, events that uh, three days are marked out and they're they're separate from, from all the other days. Uh, so today, uh, Holy Thursday, is uh, in the middle of, of Holy Week still. So maybe we should as uh, other people join on to say that, um, of course, Holy Week began Palm Sunday, and this this whole week is is uh, an event that we we call holy uh, because it is the most Im important week of the whole year. Uh, and so Palm Sunday begins that. But uh, as we get to Thursday evening, uh, we begin a, a whole little special three days in the in the middle of Holy Week. So uh, on Holy Thursday uh, itself today, um, before we get to the beginning of the, the Triduum this evening, a couple things about the, the day of, of Holy Thursday. So, uh, of course, Thursday is a 24-hour period in our, our modern calendar, uh, but the liturgical celebrations today um, primarily will focus on the beginning of the Triduum tonight with the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper. But before we get to that, uh, there are a couple other liturgies uh, of this day uh, that we should talk about. And as I, as I get ready to do that, I'm going to see if I can uh, share this video uh, over to a couple different pages. So just give me a second here while I invite uh, some other other people to join us here. So we're gonna share this event to my page. Great. And I will share this event to the parish page so that all the people at St. Patrick can join us here to uh, Facebook. And I, I suppose uh, an attempt to always get better uh, tends to uh, change <laughs> the format of of things. So um, they change the format for how one actually goes live, uh, and and so they um, made it a little bit more difficult to uh, actually go live. So hopefully I have got things fixed now and we can get back to what we're doing so okay it, it looks like i'm i'm back now so okay uh 
well, those of us uh, now joining us, John the Baptist, we've got my page, we've got St. Patrick's. Hopefully we are we are all uh, connected now. So thanks for all those who are, are joining us here on the uh, the beautiful day of Holy Thursday. We're, we're just getting everybody on and uh, getting started here. Uh, so I'm happy to have everyone uh, joining us today. Okay, uh, with, with that having been said, uh, I was just about to talk about the, the liturgies of Holy Thursday, uh, other than the big one that we know this evening. So the, this evening, of course, we've got the uh, evening Mass of the Lord's Supper, and that is, of course, the big liturgy. However, uh, there are a couple liturgical things that happen on this day, and so one of the things I'm going to point to is the Liturgy of the Hours. So uh, here at St. Patrick's Parish in Kansas City, we have the uh, practice of praying the Liturgy of the Hours every morning uh, before the morning Mass. This is actually official liturgy of the church too. And on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, the, the liturgy of the hours is especially recommended to the, the people because we don't have like the normal set of morning masses or thing. There's only one mass, and we'll, with one caveat, that will take place today. Uh, so the liturgy of the hours takes on a, a special uh, part, I guess, in the, the life of a, a parish today. So... Um, the parts of the Liturgy of the Hours, there's morning prayer that we pray every time here, uh, but there's also a, a larger office of readings. On the, the days of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, the praying of the office of readings and morning prayer uh, takes on a very uh, special kind of format. And traditionally in the church, this was known as tenebrae. Um, for historical reasons that we won't get into a, a whole lot here, over time, the, the liturgy of, of Holy Thursday uh, got pushed back to the morning of Holy Thursday instead of the evening. And so morning prayer for Holy Thursday actually got celebrated the night before. So tenebrae means shadows because, well, the office of readings and morning prayer got pushed back so far that we actually celebrated it on the night before. Happily, in the 1950s, this timing of the Triduum liturgies was corrected so that the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper actually takes place well in the evening tonight, which means that Office of Readings and Morning Prayer can take their appropriate spot back in, well, the morning of Holy Thursday. So that's what we prayed this morning. Uh, it's a, a longer set of readings and psalms and prayers. Um, so that's the first liturgy of, of Holy Thursday. Now, I mentioned that there is, there's no Mass uh, today except the, the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper. Let me say that's not entirely true, <laughs> because there is actually one other Mass that is allowed to be celebrated today, and that is what is known as the Chrism Mass. Now, I'll, I'll preface this by saying uh, the Chrism Mass is proper to Holy Thursday. So if you look in the, the Missal, the big book that says the prayers, you will find that the, the first Mass of Holy Thursday is the Chrism Mass. This is a Mass in which all the priests of the diocese and the faithful gather with the bishop ideally in the cathedral, to consecrate the holy oil that will be used in the sacraments for the next year, most especially the sacred chrism. That's why the chrism mass gets its name from the, the sacred chrism that is consecrated at that mass. Now, it is on Holy Thursday because today is the day in which we not only celebrate the institution of the Eucharist, but we, we also celebrate the, the birthday of the priesthood. Because in order to have the Eucharist, Jesus, of course, 2,000 years ago on Holy Thursday night, takes the bread and the wine and says, this is my body, this is my blood, and, and changes them into the, the true presence of his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So in order to perpetuate that, he then says to his apostles, do this in memory of me. And I, I remember way back when I was still young, I think I was maybe still in college, I went to a talk that... Uh, Father Mitch Pacwa from EWTN gave long before he was associated with EWTN. He's a, a great Hebrew scholar, and he gave an entire lesson on this word do that Jesus uses. And to, to sum up uh, an hour-long talk, the, the word do in Hebrew uh, that Jesus uses implies offer sacrifice. Moses, he said, you know, did a sacrifice uh, when he offered the blood on the altar and sprinkled the people. So when Jesus told his apostles, do this in memory of me, he literally told them, 
offer this sacrifice. And anyone who knows anything about Judaism and Hebrew knows that, well, who offers sacrifice? Priests. Priests offer sacrifice. And that, that's still true to this day. The, the reason why I am called the priest, and we use that word, is because I offer sacrifice. I offer the sacrifice of the, the Eucharist. I continue to do what Jesus told his apostles to do on that first Holy Thursday, offer the sacrifice. And so in doing so, we recognize that Jesus gave us not only the Eucharist, but he also gave us the priesthood, because that's how you get the Eucharist. Uh, so today is the birthday of the priesthood. So circle back, chrism mass. This is a mass in which all the priests of the diocese gather with the bishop to, to consecrate the oils, yes, but there's also part of it in which the priests then all renew our promises of priestly service with the bishop. Um, and so it's a Holy Thursday gathering of all the priests to celebrate the birthday of the priesthood. One problem, we're pretty spread out right now. And even in Kansas City, our diocese is pretty big. It can take three hours, you know, to drive from the farthest parts to get to Kansas City to be with the bishop. So uh, as you might imagine, there are a lot of other things going on on the day of Holy Thursday to get ready for the Triduum and things tonight. So it is allowed to transfer the Chrism Mass to a, another day, but it's supposed to be near Easter. So here in our diocese, we, we always transfer it to Tuesday in Holy Week. So two days ago, we celebrated the Chrism Mass here in Kansas City, and it was a beautiful celebration, and most all the priests are able to come. And so today, we don't have to worry about travel and, and things like that. Uh, Pope Francis, however, does still celebrate uh, the Chrism Mass on Holy Thursday, as do a lot of other dioceses around the world. So when I say that there is no Mass other than the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper, the one caveat is the Chrism Mass. Uh, but that's not a, a parish Mass. It's only one Mass that takes place with the bishop uh, only once. So keep that in mind on this Holy Thursday. So happy birthday to the priesthood. Uh, that is one of the things that we will celebrate tonight. So with that having been said, uh, it is special today in which the instructions indicate that there is to be only one mass in a parish today. Now, when I was pastor of three parishes, I remember I got there and they were doing two Holy Thursday masses and they're different parishes. So I could do that. But after the first year, I like, no, we're, we're only going to do like one Holy Thursday, uh, mass. Um, in fact, I think I, I changed that right away and said one Holy Thursday mass. Uh, so everyone can come to the church to, we, we kind of traveled to, diff, we did different stations of the Triduum in, in different of the three parishes that I, I had. Um, but it even suggests that where a small parish exists, uh, that a small parishes should join bigger parishes uh, so that these liturgies could be celebrated like with a full scola, choir, musicians, things like that, uh, so that they could be done reverently with all the ministers and servers. And they're, they're pretty big complex liturgy sometimes to put together. Uh, so there's only supposed to be one of them and little places can join bigger places. So as I mentioned, the timing of this, it is now called the evening mass of the Lord's Supper. Used to be celebrated in the morning for historical uh, reasons. We fixed it now, <laughs> essentially fixed it. Uh, so now the evening mass takes place in the evening. And so why the evening? Well, on Holy Thursday night, it's pretty obvious. Uh, Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the evening, so we we do the the same thing. Um, now, I, I should right away then say, as we you know come together in the, the the evening, yes, it is the historical time that Jesus did it. However, here's an important note about time across all three days of the Triduum. We will do things over the next three days at the historical time that, that Jesus did the events. We'll commemorate his passion, ideally at three o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow, and we'll commemorate his rising from the dead during the night of Easter on Holy Saturday night into Sunday morning. However, this is not a, a, a play acting. It is a, it is a re-presenting and to some extent making present these past events but we do not, uh, for instance, tonight, uh, recreate the Last Supper. We celebrate Mass as the Mass has evolved over the centuries. So we do not, you know, uh, as, as sadly I've seen some places try to do and, and get the spirituality wrong, we do not set up like a, a table on the, the floor 
and, and have, you know, people rec recline around the table as if they're the apostles and pretend that, you know, Jesus is doing this for the first time. That's, uh, that's not what we do. It is a celebration of a sacrament still. And we know that sacraments are sacred signs. So they, they point to a reality and they also make present a reality. So every time we celebrate the Mass, the reality of what happened 2,000 years ago in the room of the Last Supper is made present. And as we'll see, not just that night, but truly everything about Jesus, the full Jesus, is made present in the Eucharist every time we celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, so we, we do add a few special things tonight uh, to make it, as it were, a greater sign to uh, connect us to what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So there are three things that we celebrate tonight in the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper. One is, of course, the institution of the Eucharist. We commemorate that night on which Jesus gave us his body and blood under the appearance of bread and wine for the, the first time. Second, I, I mentioned it, we, we celebrate the institution of the, the priesthood uh, because Jesus gave us the priesthood so that we could have the Eucharist. But the third thing we, we celebrate tonight is Jesus's commandment to love one another. We hear that in the gospel tonight, and uh, Jesus famously shows his own fulfillment of this command to love in the symbolic action of washing the feet of his apostles. Uh, and we have the option in the modern liturgy to uh, actually see a representation of that as the, the celebrant could wash the feet of some of those of the faithful present. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but I point out now that this commandment to love one another, this new commandment, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. The, the word uh, for commandment in Latin is mandatum. And hence, sometimes you will see uh, Holy Thursday referred to as mondi Thursday, M-A-U-N-D-Y, from the Latin mandatum, M-A-N-D-A-T-U-M, mandatum. D A T U M. Uh, so if you hear versions of mandi or mandatum, just realize that's the Latin word for commandment, and it comes from tonight's gospel. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I love you. Uh, my friend Tanya's on. She says I should smile. And it's Holy Thursday, so we are we are happy. <laughs> and I uh Tanya is an incredible um member of St. Uh, Sacred Heart Parish down in Mount City and does a lot of work to get the triduum ready, so I know she's very busy today. Uh, so I'm grateful for all those who are, are joining us today. Uh, off and on, I see people coming in and out, and of course, this is available recorded. Uh, it is, interestingly, uh, it might be interesting to point out at this point that uh, today is not a holy day of obligation, uh, because, well, for one thing, th th these days of the Triduum are so holy that, to some extent, if you don't want to be there, don't be there. Uh, but the other sad reality is that, well, people have to work. So I'm doing this talk at 10 o'clock in the middle of the day on Holy Thursday, and most people will not be able to see it live because it's it's not a holy day in the sense of our secular culture. Uh, so we don't have that time off. So a lot of people will, will see this on, on replay. Uh, but I'm grateful for those like Tanya and Don and others who are, are joining live online. Uh, so yeah, it's not a holy day. So uh, it's not a holy day of obligation. Uh, because it's not a day we have off. However, it is a day in which I, I hope that even if we have to work or do other things, that we still keep holy. Okay, so those are the three things that we celebrate Holy Thursday. The institution of the Eucharist, the institution of the priesthood, and the new commandment or mandatum of Jesus to love one another. Okay, um, with that kind of generic outline, let's let's talk a little bit about how this, this liturgy is actually structured and some of the things that are unique. I'm going to start with um, the introit, the entrance antiphon, if you will. A lot of times at, at Mass today, we we take the option to sing some song, which is actually option number four uh, for what you could do at the beginning of Mass. But the first option, and the one that is right in the Missal, is the, the introit or the entrance antiphon. This is a a verse of sacred scripture, uh, often one of the Psalms, uh, that the scola or, or choir would intone. This is um, where we get the idea of Gregorian chant from. 
the the actual tones, the the music, if you will, of these have been handed down over a long time. Uh, so a lot of these chants are, are ancient. Um, tonight is a very interesting one because it's not one of the Psalms. It's actually St. Paul to the Galatians in which he says, we should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, in whom we are saved and made free. Now, I always love that we should start with that on Holy Thursday because it is, isn't it interesting that as we, we begin the sacred triduum, so remember Lent is over. <laughs> we'll, we'll have white tonight. Um, but the very first lines of the mass speak of the cross. We should glory in the cross. Well, what a, what a strange way to, to start this, this solemn supper where we, we're going to suffer the joy of the Eucharist, right? The, the cross is tomorrow. The cross is Good Friday. Let's not talk about the cross now. No, it, it's the cross hangs over the entirety of the Chodron. Because again, a note about time. We are, the reason we're not play acting this is because it's already happened. So everything we do in the sacred Triduum, we do in the light of Easter, the light of what Jesus did on Good Friday on the cross. It's because Jesus died on the cross, paid the debt for our sins, and rose to new life on Easter, that we can do what we do over these three days of the sacred Triduum. So we, it's not as if we have to pretend tonight that, oh, I wonder what will happen after the, the Last Supper. And on Good Friday, we do not have to pretend that, that oh, Jesus is dead and he's gone and we're, the world is without Jesus. No, we, we know the whole story. It's already happened. Jesus has already suffered, died, risen. That's why we're able to do what we do. So we should glory in the cross is, is a chance for, for all of us to remember that the reason we're here is because of what Jesus did on the cross, died for us. That love that he talks about at Holy Thursday, I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Well, we know how much he loved us. He loved us to the end, as it says in one of the prayers of the liturgy. He always loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. It's an older translation of one of the Eucharistic prayers. Yeah. Jesus showed his love on the cross. And so the cross overshadows everything. And in fact, uh, I was pointing out the other night when I did an introduction of this, that um, we have the Feast of Corpus Christi that, that happens after Easter, which we celebrate the, the Eucharist. And a lot of people wonder like, well, why, why isn't Holy Thursday the biggest feast day of the Eucharist? Well, it, it is, but as we'll see, it's also a, a night on which there's a a great solemnity and lack of uh, the full rejoicing because we know that part of the Last Supper is Jesus truly begins his passion. The sacrifice of Calvary, theologians will, will point to, to say actually begins in the upper room at the Last Supper. And at the end of the Last Supper, Jesus goes out and goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to begin his passion. So there's really not, uh, on Holy Thursday, it's really not uh, appropriate to have the same kind of rejoicing and flamboyance, I guess you would call it solemnity, that we have on Corpus Christi. So the church thought we needed another feast in honor of the Eucharist so that we could really go crazy, as it were, and, and really celebrate. So uh, tonight, we should glory in the cross. So we can glory in the cross because we know the whole story. The cross is not the end. Jesus is suffering, his passion, his death leads to the resurrection, and that colors the whole of the Triduum. So that's the, the first words. I should point also, as we begin the Mass, one other thing that is uh, unique tonight. Uh, when you come into the church, you will find that the, the tabernacle is, is empty. So when the ministers get to the, the sanctuary, uh, you will notice they do not genuflect because the Eucharist is not present in the tabernacle. Rather, they will bow to the altar as they approach the sanctuary. Um, so I, I will point that out to you uh, who are following along. You too can know when you come to the church tonight, do not genuflect when you enter you, your pew. I know Catholics, we are people of habit. So this is a good kind of check on that habit, I think, because how often do you come in and just genuflect before you enter your pew and, and not even think about, well, yeah, I'm giving reverence 
to the king in, in the tabernacle. The Eucharist, reserved, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity is reserved in the tabernacle. That's why we genuflect when we enter a Catholic church. We bow the knee, as it were, to the, the king of kings. Well, I think sometimes we, we just do it out of habit and we don't think about it. Well, tonight uh, and tomorrow and Holy Saturday is a, is a good kind of check on that habitual just genuflecting because the Eucharist will not be in the tabernacle tonight. Uh, so when you come in, do not genuflect. Bow to the altar, uh, which will represent Christ to us tonight. So bow to the altar, then enter your pew, and then try to avoid the sin of pride as you watch all the other Catholics come in and genuflect as you sit there and say, they don't even know what they're genuflecting to. Jesus isn't even in the tabernacle. Those poor uninformed Catholics who don't know what they're doing. So yes, bow to the altar and then try to avoid the sin of pride as you enter your pew. Okay, the reason the tabernacle is empty um, is because... Uh, Primarily, tonight at the evening mass of the Lord's Supper, uh, everyone is supposed to get to do what, uh, what should happen at every mass as much as possible, and that is that you will get to receive Eucharist that is consecrated at that actual mass that you attend. Instructions for mass tell us that uh, this, is, this is something that ideally should happen at every mass, that the, the people in the offertory procession bring forward the bread and wine, the priest receives those gifts, consecrates those gifts, and then gives them back. That is the fullness of the, the sign of what Mass is about and how the Eucharist should happen. Everyone should be able to receive the, the gifts that they brought forward, consecrated now, turned into Jesus, and given back. Now, we know that we reserve the Eucharist in the tabernacle primarily for the sick, and with big parishes, sometimes it's not easy to get those numbers right. But it's ideal. And here at St. Patrick's, we really try to do that so that everyone can receive the Eucharist consecrated at the Mass they attend. But on Holy Thursday, at least, it's required that the tabernacle be empty and so everyone can know they are receiving the Eucharist that is consecrated at the Mass that night. And that's the, the fullness of that, that sign. Uh, so that's why the tabernacle is empty. Also, we'll, we'll note that uh, the Eucharist that we consecrate tonight at the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper will be the same Eucharist that is brought out tomorrow during the commemoration of the Lord's Passion for the reception of communion. So keep that in mind as well. All right, so um, a couple things that are, are different than about the actual celebration of the Mass tonight. Subtle changes. Basically, it, it's Mass like normal, but I'll point out a couple things. Uh, the Gloria. So glory to God in the highest. We have not sung that on a Sunday anyway uh, since Lent started couple solemnities in the middle of Lent. St. Joseph, Annunciation, and here at St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Day is a solemnity for us. So three times we, we've got the Gloria there. Uh, we also sung the Gloria at the, the Chrism Mass, if you caught the intro to this. But the first time that we're going to sing the Gloria, uh, you know, since we've been fasting from it on Sundays anyway. Uh, so we are so happy that uh, Lent is over, that we, we sing the Gloria. And uh, a little addition tonight uh, the instructions indicate that the bells of the church are rung. So we will ring the bells here at St. Patrick's and our, our tower bells. We will also have the servers ring the little hand bells that they normally ring at the consecration. Um, because Lent is over. If you didn't catch the beginning of this, uh, Lent ends this afternoon. And by evening, we are outside of Lent. We are in the sacred triduum. So purple is gone. We wear white tonight. And we ring the bells during the Gloria as a, a little bit of rejoicing. Now, after the Gloria, the liturgy turns much more solemn. And to uh, show this, that the rejoicing is kind of ending as we start to enter the Passion, uh, the instructions for Mass indicate that the bells now do not ring until Saturday night at the Easter Vigil. So we will actually turn off our bells in the tower at the church and this is a little uh, part you'll notice in the, the Mass tonight. Normally, when the servers would ring the bells, when the, the priest puts his hands over the gifts, the epiclesis or the calling down the Holy Spirit, uh, and then normally when the priest raises the host and the chalice, you know, the, the servers ring the bells to remind us that this is God. Um, the bells are not allowed to be rung after the Gloria. So instead of ringing the little hand bells, uh, we have a liturgical object that is used only tonight, once a year. It is called the crotalus, C-R-O-T-A-L-U-S. C -R -O -T 
R-A-T-T-L-E-S. It is the Latin word for rattle. It is some kind of a wooden clapper. Uh, at the time when the bells would normally be rung, at the epiclesis and the showing of the host in the chalice, instead of ringing bells, since the bells are no longer rung, a wooden clapper rattle crotalus is used at that time. Um, so it's it's traditional. It's it's not mentioned in the Missal now, but uh, there's, there's instructions in the Roman Missal now that say things are to be done according to the tradition of the Roman Rite, and this is a tradition that has developed. So if you don't have it, it could just be silence. That's fine too. Uh, but it's it's kind of nice on this one night to have the, the crotalus, the rattle. Um, and so it reminds us like, oh yeah, the, this is God, it's the Eucharist, but uh, it, it's also um, a chance in which we recognize a, a greater solemnity. Uh, so a little bit of fasting tonight, even from bells after the Gloria. All right, so... Um, Interestingly, in the readings, then, um, you would think that the, the gospel would be something about the, the institution of the Eucharist. We actually don't get that tonight. We get St. Paul telling us that, you know, he has handed on to us what he himself received, namely that on the night before Jesus died, he took bread. So we, we get the institution of the Eucharist story uh, in the, the second reading. In the first reading... We, we get, as we often do in the modern lectionary, some kind of Old Testament foreshadowing of this New Testament event. And so we get the story tonight of the Passover, because Jesus, of course, celebrated the, the Eucharist on the, somehow connected to the Passover, depending on which gospel we're looking at. And he was doing that to fulfill what the, the Passover of the Old Testament prefigured. Remember, the Passover was first celebrated on the night of the, the great 10th plague of Moses, in which God went and struck down dead, the firstborn of all the Egyptians, all the beasts, the animals even. But he would pass over the houses of the faithful, his, the Israelites, when they marked their doorpost and, and lintel, the top part, with blood of a lamb that they sacrificed. When the angel of death would come by and see the blood marking the door of the Israelites, the angel of death would pass over. And I'll, I'll never forget when I, I watched the movie, The Ten Commandments, with, you know, Charlton Heston, the great Cecil B. DeMille epic movie. Um, the angel of death is depicted as this ominous cloud that hovers over and goes down, passes into the houses of the Egyptians, and there's wailing and screaming as the firstborn children are dying in every house. And then you see the, the angel of death get to the, the house where the Israelites are. It sees the blood on the door and passes over instead of killing the firstborn. That's the backdrop in which Jesus chooses to institute the Eucharist. Because just as the plagues eventually allowed Pharaoh to finally get the idea that the, he should let the Israelites go, uh, and so they, they leave in freedom, well, we too uh, have death, as it were, pass over us. We are given the freedom of new life in Christ because of what Jesus, the Lamb of God, has done in offering himself as a sacrifice. Every time you hear the word Lamb of God, don't think fuzzy little sheep isn't Jesus cute. Think Passover. Think a lamb had to die in every house of the Israelites so that their firstborn would not die. That's what we celebrate tonight as well. The fact that the firstborn son of God, Jesus, died. The Lamb of God died so that all of us could have death pass over and we could be free. That's why we read the Passover account tonight. And there, there is a, a beautiful line in the, the Passover ritual uh, to this day that uh, when the, a Jewish family celebrates the Passover, um, the one of the sons is supposed to ask the father who is celebrating it, why is this night different from every other night? It's part of the Passover ritual. So we might uh, ourselves, you know, ask why is tonight different from every other night? And it's interesting because the father is supposed to respond because on this night, the God led the Israelites, you know, from slavery to freedom as the angel of death passed over. Um, there is a Jewish sense in which, yeah, that past event of Passover 
is made present. This is a, there's actually a word for it in Greek called anamnesis. It's a, it means to remember, but uh, it, it's more than simply remembering with the mind. It's a, a remembering that actually makes present the event that's being called to mind. So that's what happens at the, the Passover for Jews today. They, re, they really think that the saving acts of the Passover are made present. Uh, and the same thing happens for us. The event of the Last Supper, as I said, is made present to us. And this happens in every Mass. It's not that we re-sacrifice Jesus. It's not a new sacrifice that comes about at every Mass. It's the one sacrifice of Jesus made present across time. So we read in the first reading about the Passover. Then we read in the second reading from St. Paul about how Jesus then took that Passover ritual and fulfilled it in the Eucharist. In fact, he actually uses the word new covenant. That's a, that's a big, big word in the scriptures because it only occurs twice. Uh, once in the Old Testament, when the prophet is talking about uh, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with my people. It will not be like the old covenant, which they broke. Uh, so there in the Old Testament, we hear the prophet talk about a new covenant. Uh, so the days will come when I will establish a new covenant, God says. Wait now a thousand years more. And finally, we get the second instance of new covenant mentioned in scripture. And that is at the last supper when Jesus takes the chalice and says, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. So we will get uh, that fulfillment of Jesus at the, the last supper. So he fulfills everything that Passover prefigured or was a type of what would happen with Jesus. Someone asked this question the other night uh, after I was doing a little introduction to Holy Week and like, what's all the deal with, with Passover? What, why this lambs? Well, if you think about it, God essentially drilled into his people for a couple thousand years. If there is sin, there must be atoning sacrifice for that sin. And sin offends an infinite God, so that sin deserves death. If there is sin, there must be death. There must be sacrifice. So God, in his mercy, allowed that when his people sinned, rather than them having to die, he allowed the sacrifice of an animal, often a lamb. And the lamb would symbolically, at least, atone for the sins of the people. Now, the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament reminds us, how could a lamb possibly take away sins? <laughs> but God allowed it to be a, a sign, a type. And it, at least you could see, like, I sinned, so this animal had to die. Today, that would that would really, you know, upset people. Like, we, we respond well to, like, animals dying is sad. Maybe Israelites, not so much. Uh, if you went to the temple in Jerusalem uh, at the time of Jesus, number one thing you would see would be a big barbecue. It, his priests were constantly offering the sacrifices of lambs that people would bring to atone for sins. So when you hear, behold, the Lamb of God, think Passover. Think Jesus is the Lamb of God whose blood washes away our sins. Marks, as it were, as some of the fathers of the church have said, it's as if with the blood of Christ, we mark the doorpost and lintel of our, our mouth, uh, the way that they mark the doorpost and lintel of their houses at the first Passover, um, so that the angel of death passes by. Um, and and so uh, that's something that we, we also celebrate. Uh, Don is asking, did he use the cup that was the cup that no one was allowed to use or touch at the Passover meal? Uh, that I'm not sure in, in, so in, in the Passover ritual, actually, um, people would be allowed, the cup would be passed around and, and shared. And so we, we see that in the, what Jesus does when he gives them the, the, the cup and passes it around for them, um, to drink. So not sure, Don, um, uh, what might, uh, be behind that question, but feel free to contact me. We can, we can talk about that see what you're talking about. Okay, so um, when it comes time then for the gospel, I mentioned the first reading, Passover, Old Testament, Exodus, uh, New Testament reading from St. Paul, institution of the Eucharist. The gospel then, rather than being one of the accounts of the institution of the Eucharist in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get tonight's gospel from the gospel of John. 
in which John of the four Gospels does not have uh, a play-by-play of the institution of, you know, here Jesus took the bread, Jesus took the cup. Rather, uh, probably because Matthew, Mark, and Luke were were already written uh, at that time, um, he doesn't include the institution narrative, but also because um, John, in the sixth chapter of his gospel, kind of gives his teaching on the Eucharist, and that's where Jesus famously says, you know, this this is tr- this bread is truly my my body. The blood is true drink. This is my blood. It's not bread and wine. So John goes at great length into the elements of the Eucharist in chapter six. So in his account of the Last Supper, John gives us a detail that the other three gospel writers do not give us, and that is that in the middle of the supper, Jesus got up, took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, and went to wash his disciples' feet. Mentioned, if you're just joining us, I mentioned at the beginning that the the Latin word here is is connected with Jesus's uh, saying, I give you a new commandment, love one another. The word for commandment in Latin is mandatum, and so this is this whole rite of washing the, the feet of the apostles is sometimes called the, the mandatum. Uh, just means commandment. Jesus is showing his apostles what it means to love one another by this symbolic act of washing their feet. Now, it would have had a practical uh, reason to. I mean, if you're walking around the dusty streets of the Holy Land, uh, your, your feet get dirty. So the rest of you is probably cleaner, but your your feet need washing. And it would actually be a part of hospitality when someone would come to your house, that they would be provided water. And But obviously a servant would would normally do this, or you would do it yourself. So by by washing his feet, Jesus is showing his apostles what it is to be a leader in his church. He's just instituted the, the priesthood. He's made them the ones who will offer the sacrifice of the Eucharist, but then he gives them this lesson of, well, what is it like to be a leader in my church? <laughs> okay, you're going to be the important guys that that offer the most important sacrament? All right, you want to be first? Be the last. You're going to be the leader? Be the servant of all. And so Jesus gives the example of what it is to be a leader. It's to be a servant leader. And so he goes to his apostles and takes the place of a servant and washes their feet. And uh, I, I love uh, St. Peter because he, he is so full of energy and, and zeal. And so he, he always thinks he knows better than Jesus. So Jesus comes to Peter to wash his feet. And Peter's like, no, absolutely not, Lord. You will not positively not wash my feet. This is below you. No way am I letting you wash my feet. And Jesus has to say to Peter, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you'll have no share of eternal life with me. Okay, Lord, then, then wash everything. Wash my head, wash my body, my hands. Just wash, wash it all. And like, Peter, calm down, you know, just the feet, okay? Um, so I, I, I love that. Um, but I, I, I use that then as a backdrop to there, there's an option in the modern liturgy now in, in which after the gospel, in which we hear of the washing of the feet, that there can be a symbolic representation of, of what we just read in the gospel as the celebrant then in the person of Christ would represent this event, as it were, to wash the feet of, of some of the people, some of the faithful that are there. Now, historically, uh, this washing of the feet, it, it is a, an, an ancient ritual, but it it normally took place not in the, the liturgy of Holy Thursday. Um, the, the, eventually this became like the, the Pope would wash the feet of 12 poor persons sometime during the day of Holy Thursday. Um, it was a, a ritual that was outside of the, the liturgy, kind of just a symbolic act of, of charity. In the, the reforms of Holy Week that, that took place in uh, 1950s under Pius XII, so 1955, this uh, Holy Thursday liturgy was revived, and they um, they took this washing of the feet that had been going on at various times in monasteries and the Pope and things, and they they put it in the Holy Thursday liturgy, and that was a uh, a bit of an innovation in the the nineteen fifties, um, but it was re- required at the time uh, since it was a representation of what was happening in the gospel. The point was, I guess, that you could hear the, the gospel read 
and then see it as it were kind of dramatically presented or relived out so that the priest was to wash the feet of uh often 12 men to represent the uh the apostles um so you had the reading of Jesus washing the feet of his apostles and then you had the priest washing the feet of 12 men couple couple things on this one interestingly it, it did have to be men it males is what it said in the instructions um to represent the apostles however it didn't have to be 12 it just said men men plural uh however it was normally always 12 because that's what we were doing um this was the case until very recently uh and people would debate about this every year oh can we wash the feet of women and the answer was no it really did say males uh but in our our modern time uh pope francis then decided to actually change this instruction to say that the the priest is free to wash anyone's feet and in an explanatory note he said you know it would be nice to maybe make this a representative sample of the the people so what we see here is that the the reason that it used to have to be 12 or at least males was because what this washing of the feet presented was a representation of what we read in the gospel. Jesus washing the feet of his apostles. It's as if we we actually did a kind of little dramatic presentation. Pope Francis is saying that essentially over the years, the meaning of this rite changed. And it hasn't you know, been very long, only since the 1950s. But especially in the 70s, 80s, 90s, it, it evolved such that the reason we were washing the feet of women is to say like, well, this isn't a representation of Jesus washing the feet of the apostles. This has now become the, the priest doing what Jesus said. So the priest now would wash the feet of multiple different groups of people to show, well, this is the priest doing what Jesus said and that he is serving his parishioners. And so it should be a representative sample of the parishioners. So that's an additional way to see what this foot washing rite is about. It's, it's different than what it was in history, where it's a representation of Jesus washing the feet of his apostles. Now it's become the priest, not as Jesus, but the priest as himself, uh, showing that he's there to serve his people, which is a perfectly good sign, too. Um, it's just we needed the Pope to change the law uh, so that it would say this is what it now represents. So um, with all that having been said, Yes, it is now allowed for the priest to wash the feet of women, children even. However, I'll, I'll point out that the whole thing, though, remains completely optional. And and, and quite frankly, um, when, when I have celebrated the Holy Thursday liturgy, uh, I, I've chosen the option most of the times not to, to do the washing of the feet. Um, not because it's not a, could be a beautiful thing. However, it requires a lot of instruction as to what it's really a about and it, it can become a distraction on an otherwise kind of solemn thing because in order to do it it's like after the gospel you, you, you gotta you gotta have enough people to to bring out probably a bunch of chairs and it takes a bit of time and it, it can uh kind of create a a weird sort of break in the flow of the liturgy but more than anything uh it, it can be a distraction and people start wondering not so much oh isn't isn't it beautiful that Jesus watched the feet of his apostles? It, or, or even, isn't it beautiful that Father is serving the people? But it can almost become like, well, now who's getting their feet washed? Now, why did that person get chosen? And oh, and, and do we have enough representative people? Like, do we have someone from the Hispanic community and our Burmese community? And, you know, and it, it can become about who is getting their feet washed rather than the, the love of Jesus that he showed by washing his apostles' feet. So, it can be done well. It can also become a bit of a distraction. Um, so I've normally chosen to use the option not to do it. And I know I know a lot of places where it's becoming more uh, frequent that it's 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 not done. Uh, we hear it in the gospel, and it's beautiful to meditate on that. Uh, but priests should show that they are willing to wash the feet of their people every day by <laughs> going to the hospital to anoint people are dying to hear their confessions. Uh, so if if the right can symbolize that fine uh, it's just there's there's somewhat danger that it might become a distraction so the washing of the feet however could take place uh after the gospel and it could be 12 it doesn't have to be 12 
it's probably better that it not be 12 now, since clearly we're saying these people do not represent the apostles because we've got women, children, everybody. So I would probably rather that it not be 12 now, that it be a representative sample of the parish, as Pope Francis says. It is still acceptable to wash the feet of 12 men. And, and then it's, it's perfectly obvious what this represents. It's the, the older understanding of Jesus washing the feet of his apostles. So there it is on the washing of the feet. Um, the other thing that uh, is different in the middle of this mass, and it's a subtle thing you might not recognize, but I'll point it out so that you will not miss it. During the, the consecration in the Eucharistic prayer, uh, you know, it says, on the night before he was to suffer, he took bread with eyes raised to heaven, uh, you know, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you eat of it. That, that little bit on the night before he was to suffer. We say that at, at every mass in the, the first Eucharistic prayer. On Holy Thursday, there's a small change. There's a little addition. On the night before he was to suffer for our salvation, the salvation of all, that is today. That little phrase, that is today, hodie in Latin, today, um, that goes, again, back to our, our notion of time, that, that Greek word anamnesis, remembering, a remembering that takes a past event and makes it present. That's, that's what we do in every Mass, but especially on this evening Mass of the Lord's Supper, we, we recognize that we are making present the historical event of 2,000 years ago when Jesus first did this. So on the night before he was to suffer, uh, that is today. Uh, it, it kind of, it's just a little thing, but it does kind of remind us that somehow what we do every Mass, but especially tonight around our altars, uh, participates in that one event that happened 2,000 years ago. It's all as if time does not exist, and, and we are all united in that, that one present moment of, of Jesus what he did 2,000 years ago is present tonight, today, as it says in the consecration. So then um, the rest of the Mass goes on. Remember that the clapper, the crotalus, the wooden clapper, since the bells don't ring. Everyone receives the Eucharist that's consecrated at that Mass. And then the ending of, of Mass is a little different. So um, normally at the end of Mass, you know, we, we get a blessing, sign of the cross, and then the, the deacon will sing, Ite Misa Est, go, the... the the Mass is, is ended, uh, and we say thanks be to God. There is actually no dismissal at the end of tonight's Mass. And I'll just say that this is partly because we, when we begin the Triduum Liturgy on Holy Thursday night, we, we have the, the sign of the cross, the greeting. You, you will not have a dismissal again until the end of the Easter Vigil. So it's, it's as if the, the Triduum Liturgy, the three days, is really all one liturgy. It begins Holy Thursday night, but it doesn't end uh, until we get to Easter. So keep that in mind, as there is no dismissal from the liturgy tonight. Rather, there is a procession with the Eucharist to some other place, uh, literally, another place, it says. So ideally, not, not even back in the church, but maybe to some other building, this is to symbolically represent Jesus, who at the end of the Last Supper, we know, went out across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. So by carrying Jesus in procession in the Eucharist, we are reenacting, but also joining ourselves in that entering of the passion of our Lord. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there we know he, he was in such agony that he, he sweat blood. Uh, a, a medical condition, which, you know, doctors tell us can actually happen under extreme distress. So we know how, you know, distressed Jesus was in his agony. And he asked his apostles, watch, wait, pray, pray that you may not be subject to the, the trial, to the test. Um, could you not watch one hour with, with me? So tonight at the end of Mass, the Eucharist is taken and it's put in some other place, what is often called the altar of repose or, or rest. It represents for us the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, the Eucharist is not exposed in the monstrance. It's, it's in a tabernacle. But we are invited to do what Jesus invited his apostles to do, to watch and, and wait, uh, to pray. And in a real way, our prayer on this night 
comforts Jesus 2,000 years ago. We, we do what, to some extent, the apostles could not do very well 2,000 years ago. We tell Jesus, I will pray with you. I will watch. I will wait. I will, I will comfort you in your passion. And so we have a chance to do that tonight. As Mass ends, no dismissal, transfer the Eucharist to the altar of repose. There's the singing of the famous hymn of Thomas Aquinas, Pange Lingua, that he wrote for Corpus Christi. The last two verses of this are the tantum ergo that we sing in, in benediction. And so we, we end our chant with that. And then it just says, all depart in silence. No dismissal. It says if we, we leave the church, the physical building, but we're, we're not meant to leave the spiritual recollection that is proper to these days. Even though we leave the building, and maybe, as I said, it's not a day off work tomorrow on Good Friday, uh, as much as possible, we should try to live the spirit of being in the liturgy over these days. So to pray the, the rosary, perhaps, to read the scriptures, to pray the, the liturgy of the hours, certainly, um, to not leave, as it were, the spirit of this liturgy over the entirety of the three days, even though we might leave the church. Now, I, I have a little tradition on Holy Thursday night of, of trying to visit um, multiple churches, to visit the altar of repose at, at multiple churches. I traditionally try to hit seven of them. Um, that was easy when I was at Catholic University in D.C. Uh, studying canon law because there were churches everywhere. And so I could walk a lot of times to seven churches, and it, I would pass little groups of people. And it was kind of nice. In the middle of the night, you've got people going here and there to visit Jesus. Uh, to watch and wait. So I will I will have to drive, but I will try to hit seven churches tonight. Um, and I invite you, wh whatever you do, maybe you stay after Mass. Maybe you you keep watch until midnight or whenever the, the church closes. Um, this night is different from every other night. That's what the, the young boy asked his father in the Passover liturgy. Why is tonight different from every other night? Because on this night, God saved his people through the blood of a lamb. It's on this night. That is today. On the night before he was to suffer, that is today. Jesus took bread and wine for the first time and said, this is my body, this is my blood, gave himself to us as the definitive lamb of God, told his apostles, do this in memory of me, literally offer this sacrifice, and in so doing gave us the priesthood. And then to his new priests, he told them, I give you a new commandment. Just as Moses got the Ten Commandments, I give you a new commandment. Imagine how big that is. There are Ten Commandments. Jesus says, no, I give you a new one. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he, he shows them this servant love and the washing of their feet. But then most especially, he goes to his passion. He loved them to the end. And that's what we'll talk about tomorrow as we... Come back again at 10 o'clock tomorrow on Good Friday to talk about the liturgy of the passion of our Lord. Pray tonight would fill you with the great joy. Thanksgiving for the Eucharist, thanksgiving for the gift of the priesthood, uh, thanksgiving for the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, in whom we are saved and made free. May you experience that tonight and over the course of these three days we call the three days, the sacred triduum. God bless you.